This is a spinning wheel. On all, prior to going to the loom, all fibers are first need to be spun from the natural state on a spinning wheel, very much like this. And you can see this wheel is being driven by my foot. And it is in actual fact turning what is known as a spindle, this side mechanism here, which of course winds the yarn in its fine form around this bobbin. And that begins to create the yarn prior to going to a, uh, the loom itself. Before this, of course, this was, is a 19th century antique. Before this, we used drop spindles, which are very much like this. And we find these throughout historic digs as far back as the ancient uh, civilizations in Egypt and the Mesopotamian cultures, usually in the, the nature of a, a ball of clay attached onto a piece of wood or a piece of bone. So that as the yarn is taken from the hand, it is then wound by dropping this spindle. I'll just hold my hand for a second here, turning it and then the yarn is being spun and wound onto this piece of spindle. And eventually, as you begin to produce the yarn, you then wind it onto the bottom part of the spindle, and that produces the yarn, very much the same as a spinning wheel. And this is then taken off and wound onto small bobbins and is then ready for weaving. Prior to this, of course, we have to get the wool from the sheep, and it looks very much like this. This is raw wool from the sheep itself, taken from the, the back of the sheep. And it is still in its grease and very much a tangled mass. Before we begin to put this to the spinning wheel, we have to first tease the yarn to get a very fine, I'll just drop a section here, a very fine uh, segment of it. And it is then placed onto these cards, which look like this, you see. They are then stretched on like so, spreading it very carefully, like that. And then with the second card, we place one over the other, and we begin to comb the wool until the fibers are parallel. This is very important to get all the yarns in a very uh, straight line, side by side, so that you can indeed spin a very fine, straight piece of yarn without lumps or nodules or bits of uh, vegetation that might be caught in, in the animal itself. So that, that has to be carded first. It then comes from the card looking very much like this. These are known as rolags. They are simply carded wool. And when you hold up to the light, you can see they're, they're quite transparent. There's no heavy knots anywhere. So that when I begin to spin this yarn, I will then pull it from the, the end of the rolag. And the spinning wheel will twist it at a, at a high speed. And of course, the the scales on the wool itself will link together to create a piece of yarn. Wool is extremely important and we have two types of wool. One is known as worsted, which is a very fine, straight fibered wool, uh, yarn itself. And also the carded wool, which is very much like this, round and woolly and soft. This is very much the, the kind of yarn that is used for making um, Harris tweed or warm coating or knitting for knitting sweaters because the air is caught from the outside and is warmed by the heat from the body and the air is circulating in the yarn itself and that makes it a very warm commodity for, for, for uh, working with. A very important fiber in itself and again one of the most important fibers historically. The second one of course is the mystifying silk and I have here with me a silk cocoon. Let's pull it free here. And that's what a cocoon looks like, a silk cocoon. It is woven or spun around the worm itself when it's uh, ready to make the transformation stage from worm to larva to then the metamorphosis into the moth itself. And you can see, probably you can on camera, it's a very, very fine filament, that the filament is, is coming off the silk cocoon quite finely. In order to separate the cocoon uh, silk from the cocoon, it must be placed in boiling water, or at least water of about 90 to 100 degree temperatures. That dissolves the gum for a while, and then each strand will pull off and create one long mile of silk. If we were to cut the inside of this apart, you would then see inside that the actual insect dried out because they were then taken from the, the um, spinning or the cocoon space or shed itself, collected and then subjected to heat 
and that killed the, the insect inside, so that when it was ready to make the morphous, me metamorphous state, it didn't exude an acid, which will burn the top part of this to let itself free. So we must be sure we kill the insect while it's still in its transformation stage. Um, the Thailand silk that I, I showed at, Good at Goodman's Textiles comes in exact exactly the same way, only the insect has been allowed to escape from the cocoon. It then dissolves a small pa patch on top, and of course that breaks all this thread, and no longer do we have a mile of thread, but we have possibly two or three inches long the distance around the cocoon itself. As it's being spun off from the cocoon onto uh, skeins of silk preparatory to weaving with it, it comes in hanks very much like this. This I bought in France a number of years ago when I was studying silk weaving in Lyon. And it's very much like the kind of uh, silk that is uh, produced in China, Japan, Switzerland, France, Germany, England today. Comes in hank form, has a very, very high luster. It's a magnificent luster. It gets the luster simply by being pulled through a series of glass pulleys and the glass polishes the silk as it's coming from the cocoon. Very little other processing is required. You are then ready to weave with this into any fabric you wish. Of course, it more often than not, goes into a dye process first. I have here also a cone of dyed silk. These were dyed in Paris in 1920. Get the two of them here. And you can see that we have wonderful, lustrous, highly polished silk. However, in order to see the silk, this piece that is very, very fine in my hand consists of, in actual fact, eight strands of cocoon silk because one single strand is virtually impossible to see and is difficult to work with. So that they use the eight strands put together to create one single strand of silk. Then it is indeed ready for, for spinning. Two types of course are used. This is then either spun, twisted very, very hard to create a warp which needs to be under greater strength, or left in a soft fashion like this, which of course is what we recognize when you look at silk satin, that nice sheen across the surface of the, of the silk is the, the in actual fact, final processing of the silk now being hit contained into the warp. Silk, very, very valuable, and many an empire has been built around it, and certainly many traditions and legends have been placed around it. Next on, on the roster of importance, we have some raw flax here. Now, raw flax, as you can see, is a rather dull, matted, brown, brown beige shade. In actual fact, there are several types of, of flax, this probably is Canadian flax, uh, Belgian flax is a softer, grayer flax, Russian flax is a, a grayer, browner flax. And it, uh, when it's grown locally, it's really anybody's color. It's not really important the color at all because it goes into the bleaching fields. And in a later episode, we'll show you what these bleaching fields look like and, and that some of the processes involved in manufacturing cloth from flax itself. The flax, in actual fact, comes from a plant with a, uh, um, what is it? like a, a straw casing, very much like a grass fin uh, f uh, on the outside. That's why it's called the bast fibers. It's very much like a, like a grass. Inside the grass, once the, the, the outer husk has been dissolved away by letting it sit in rotting water or stagnant water for a period of time, it then releases all these fibers inside. They are then taken to a card or to a hackling block and they're combed to separate the coarse fibers and the, fi the finest fibers inside. And it's from this, they are then placed on the spinning wheel and, of course, pulled and spun at a very high rate. And they spin very much as, I, as I'm doing with my hand here. You can see that it's beginning to pull together and making quite a fine and firm thread. Linen is extremely strong, not nearly as strong as silk. Silk has the same tensile strength uh, as, as steel, for that matter, steel of a similar uh, thickness. But certainly linen has that great capacity for being cool and being uh, wonderfully white and refreshing and easy to, to work with for the great um, religious uses it's been put to or for embroideries or even for garment making itself. But that's what flax looks like in its raw state, having been taken from the plant in its straw form, the straw being taken from that and creating a ball of raw flax ready for spinning. And of course, the one that has caused spinners and manufacturers, the greatest problem throughout history is the cotton plant. This is a ball of natural cotton that we were given by the um, textile mill in Windsor, Nova Scotia that we're going to visit in another episode. But you can see that it's very, very tiny, fragile filaments, very, very short. 
So when you have to spin this, you have to spin it at a very high speed in order for the fibers to collect together and begin to produce the fiber that is pulling off, as you see it in my hand now. And we'll see this being spun on a commercial machine at the Windsor, Nova Scotia mill. But the plant itself, in actual fact, each of the seeds inside the cotton plant are, have one single strand of this uh, filament, which is only about, it's hard to measure on camera, but it's about an inch and uh, three quarters in length. But it's contained in the plant like so. So as the plant is developing, the seeds are getting larger and larger, and as it begins to ripen, the plant breaks open like so, and you have a ball of cotton. That ball is, is collected from the plant. It is then put through a processing no, no, known as ginning, as a matter of fact, not the thing you drink, but the gin was developed by Elias Whitney. And that cuts off the seed from the, the, the uh, fiber itself, and then the fiber is then processed and combed and spun into very fine yarn. This, of course, is twisted onto a cone very much like this one beside me here, showing a strand of ready-to-spin or ready-to-weave, in this case, cotton yarn. And it was this type of cotton yarn that during the 19th century, John Mercer, in his explorations of trying to find ways of making cotton go farther and the raw um, state of fibers become much more um, adaptable to the uses required for the larger growth of cities at the time, that he subjected it to a process known as mercerization. And that was simply, <coughs> excuse me, placing the yarn into a bath of caustic soda, and of course these fine curly Q fibers in the cotton itself suddenly lengthened and became highly polished. That gives a very fine thread for um, a, a much more highly polished fabric known as mercerization. It's also the treatment applied to sewing thread, so when you sew with thread, it doesn't break. An interesting thing to know about sewing thread, that when you take it from the, the reed of cotton, as a for instance, assume, let me see, this to be a cotton thread, uh, a, a spool of thread, that the yarn that comes off for sewing purposes comes off the, the bobbin like so, that you put the needle, this end through the needle, and you cut that end and you knot it because when it's spun, it's wound on that way on the bobbin. So if perchance you take it off and may place the knot at the opposite end, you'll find as you're sewing the yarn begins to ball up and eventually break or begins to fray. It's very important to understand these things. However, most sewers are not told this currently because it's not part of our modern culture. Certainly ladies who sewed in the 18th and 19th centuries knew how to treat the fibers and were therefore more able to sew at greater speeds and do much finer work. It's also important not to make the length of sewing thread more than 21 inches, and there's a simple reason for that. Historically, when embroiderers were using threads to embroider with or to stitch garments together with, the distance from the garment, from the needle and the thimble, to a distance beyond that is about 21 inches. So you can very rapidly work like this. And when you consider women often worked in teams around a central area, it was important you didn't make your arm go beyond your reach and therefore cause damage to the person sitting next to you. So it developed a, a technique of making the thread shorter so that you didn't get the yarn winding on itself and ultimately breaking. And when you're working professionally, that speed is extremely important. So these fibers, all of them, are known as the four natural fibers that man has developed over the centuries for his use in producing textiles. There is a fourth one, of course, as I mentioned, at Goodman Textiles, rayon, which is simply wood pulp mulched down in chemicals and then processed through a spinneret, very much like a shower head, and the fine filaments come off very much like silk, and they ultimately produce an artificial silk, therefore expanding the market for the use of silk itself and also making it possible for those who can't afford to buy the real silk in its pure state and to get a silken-like fabric itself. We don't have any wood pulp here, nor have we the, the special mechanics to show that, but it has been declared a natural fiber over the past 25 years simply because it comes from a very important part of our natural resources. Throughout the world, before weavers were organized into groups known as guilds, you had weavers' guilds, tailors' guilds, dyers' guilds, spinning guilds, sewing guilds, and they were certainly groups of people developed in the, in the Middle Ages so that they could spend their time just perfecting one craft. And that perfection allowed for people to produce at a very much higher rate, repeating themselves day in, day out, producing one commodity. So the development of the guilds in the Middle Ages were an extremely important part economically to any community. 
you had communities of people working in these special crafts that produced for their local use and what was excess was then used as a trade commodity and was a way of making money for that particular community. This all rather died out in the 19th century when the Industrial Revolution took place and most of the crafts were being mechanized to such a degree that the hand craftsman eventually was considered to be redundant. It was brought back in a movement known as the Art and Craft Movement by William Morris in the late 19th century, a way of going back to what he thought was a much better, much saner period in history, the period of the Middle Ages, as a direct re reaction against the Industrial Revolution and the great producing and the great vulgarity of fabrics and raw materials being used during the 19th century. So we have an entire history from the Middle Ages to the 19th century evolving around the gathering of raw fibers to the spinning of these fibers into um, various types of yarn to be, to be woven into various types of fabrics, very much like the ones you saw in Goodman Textiles in our last episode and very much like the fibers you're going to see being woven on my loom at my studio very shortly. When we go to the, the studio, we're going to see the, the basic components of the loom and begin to understand exactly what happens when thread from a spinning wheel is wound onto a shuttle and then placed into a warp and pr uh, progressed into fabric. So let us now proceed to my studio and see what a hand loom actually does. Welcome to my studio. This is my loom. I bought it some years ago in Sweden, solid pine, not too unlike its predecessor designed some 3,000 years ago. In fact, looms haven't changed a great deal in that length of time. They have become more mechanized. During the 19th century, with the increase in the mass market and the increase in larger societies, they became power-driven and are now, of course, electrically driven. But the machine itself hasn't changed. It is essentially exactly the same as it was first created by the ancient Egyptians. On this loom, I have designed a wide variety of textiles, and I brought some with me to show you. This silk scarf was initially designed by me 10 years ago to show weavers how to weave with fine silk, a very costly fiber. And in this case, the weave itself is very simple, plain weave, simply using the color as the design element in the, the fabric itself. And of course, allowing the luster of the silk to take over and become the major part of the design. Silk is not difficult to weave, but simply because its fiber, fiber is extremely fine, tends to frighten most weavers away from its use. I rather enjoy that, that challenge. Next, I have a sample of coat fabric that I designed as a prototype some years ago for some winter coats and some suits. This fabric has come directly off the loom and is known as gray fabric. And that has nothing to do with its color. It simply means it still contains the texture and the tightness from the loom as originally wo woven. Most fabrics are, of course, under great tension on the loom and need to be washed and then brushed to soften the design overall once the fabric has been produced and then is ready for garment making. Another piece of weaving I'm presently just finished. This is for a carrying bag I'm making as a Christmas present for a friend of mine. And it's really a, just an exercise in various textures and techniques. Simply woven again, utilizing color as a main element of design. As a designer myself, I prefer to work in simple techniques using color and yarn to create the overall impact. This, of course, will be lined with plastic to make it um, waterproof and then closed at the top with a handmade leather handle across the top of it and then be wrapped up and presented at Christmas time. A series of textiles I did some time ago for, on a commission were some tablecloths, napkins, curtains, and a carpet for a lady's kitchen. This was a fragment left over after the commission had ended. I often keep samples of these simply for my own records and use in my own studio. But oftentimes I get clients who want to have things designed specifically for their own homes and to blend with the design of their own interiors. I find that much more challenging than simply weaving miles of yardage for the simple sake of weaving a piece of fabric. Some years ago when I was in Europe studying textiles, I was presented with a shirt in Hungary, I believe, and it was given to me by a curator from the Hungarian uh, Folk Museum 
And this began to excite me and led me ultimately to studying textiles. This shirt was made in 18, about 1804, made entirely by hand by the groom's mother, and she wove the body of the fabric, as well as the, the fine tapes and the fine braids through here, as well as the tapes at the wrist end, all hand-woven, and then she proceeded to embroider the entire thing as a garment of celebration, in this case, a wedding shirt. And this kind of uh, discovery excited me to press on to learn more about weaving, and ultimately, as I became involved with Fortress Lewisburg and his restoration, that information began to pay off great dividends. I no longer produce textiles for the market anymore. I simply weave for my own pleasure and the odd exhibition. At the present time, on the loom is a very simple weave known technically as bound weaving. It is a, uh, a Swedish technique. The weft yarn was imported from Norway, as you can see on this ski shuttle, and the warp was spun in Sweden. Very simple weave. The design, as, as, as you can see, is hanging above the loom to guide me on my way through as I'm working rather freehand through it. Entirely the mixing of yarns from the darkest uh, indigo blue up to a dark red. Now to look at the various mechanical parts of the loom, just so you understand the process of creating a textile. We'll go first of all to the back of the loom, where we have the back beam. Each of the warp threads stretched across the loom are first wound onto this back beam here. That keeps all the threads under perfect tension. They're all measured the same length, and they're kept here, so as one is weaving ultimately the fabric, we move and advance the warp forward. It's just simply a holding device. Each of these warp threads are then threaded through what we know, call our eyes, string eyes on these harnesses. In this case, there are four harnesses. And each of the threads are then threaded through so that when I depress the pedal, each of these harnesses will indeed lift the threads too much on occasion in various combinations. And this ultimately creates a pattern. To make the whole process work more smoothly, these harnesses are then attached to the top part of the loom, to these um, wooden struts, and they're then passed through and attached to pedals underneath the loom. So when I'm sitting at the front of the loom and I depress the pedal, it will then activate the warp itself, opening what we call our sheds, and then allow the weaving to proceed. After the threads have been passed through the eyes of the harness, they are then passed through this comb here, which is known as a reed. It was given that name centuries ago because it used to be made from marsh reeds, now, of course, made of stainless steel, which, of course, is much more efficient, but still bears the name reed. And this, of course, keeps the yarn of the warp in a wide position and equally balanced straight through. At the same time, it's being contained in the batten and this batten is indeed what you use to push the weft against the fell of the cloth and ultimately will begin to produce a textile. I'll go to the front of the loom and just pass a shuttle through and show you what a shed is. First of all, I should take off my shoes. Weaving is much better in stocking feet because you want to feel the pedals automatically without having to look at them. First of all, I will depress one of the pedals, which then raises the harness thus, and of course creates what is known as a shed. That's a V of the two warp threads laying alternately one on the other. Then I pass this shuttle through the shed. I better advance some yarn through the shed, and that is thrown straight through into my opposite hand. And I place the, th the yarn carefully in the shed, and I pack it together with a beater and pack it tight. This, of course, needs to have a, a shed chain, so what I've done is move from one shed to the next, and that locks the yarn in position. Then I advance more yarn, pass the shuttle through again, hold it, then locate it, making sure that I have sufficient yarn to cover the warp threads, because the essence of this technique is indeed to cover the warp threads entirely 
and I pack it in rather smartly with the batten, the shed being changed, and that begins to build up the, the fabric. As the fabric is being built up from each successive shot, it is then wound on to the cloth beam, which contains the finished fabric. After the warp has been completely woven, it is then taken off the loom and is ready for final processing. This device here is called a stretcher. And as you're weaving, because of the elasticity in, in wool, it needs to be held out so that you keep the, the same width of fabric consistently straight throughout. This has been adapted to the modern um, industrial machine by having teeth at the side of the loom, which does exactly the same thing. Many weavers tend not to like this stretcher device. They tend to feel that it is a sign of not being able to weave. But natural fat has been used for centuries. It's, it's a classic tool for weaving and is very important to get a good, perfect weave throughout. I'll just take it off simply to show you that it is a stick like this with teeth on both ends that is then inserted at the edge of your warp and locked in position to keep it out so that when you're working the fabric together, these end threads that are coming through the dents on the, the reed don't rub them raw and eventually cause these to break. You want to keep a nice even edge at the outside edge. Having woven a piece, I'll just undo the warp a bit to show you the, the carpet that I've woven so far and give you an idea what's happened to the, the color of it. I release the ratchet, which is, has the, the warp under great tension, and I'll wind it forward a pace. And then pull forth the carpet. And you can see how the color has changed from the red-orange range into the yellow, the green, and finally the indigo coloring. After I finish weaving, I will then brush it carefully and tie off all the loose ends of the, the warp into a braid finish we call Swedish braid. And that is essentially how a piece of fabric is indeed woven, this very simply. Next week, we're going to, uh, in our next episode, we're going to go to the Nova Scotia Textile Company in Windsor, Nova Scotia, and look at the actual process of a textile very common to us today, a T-shirt. We'll look at the process of carding, the simple fibers, a blending of cotton and polyester, into the spinning of threads on great industrial machines, from those threads onto the new industrial knitting machines, which produce tubular fabric at great speed, then into the dyeing rooms to watch it being dyed, the brushing rooms to brush a finish on the, the finished fabric, to the next floor to watch them being cut into t-shirt shapes, then finally to the sewing rooms on the top floor and watch about a hundred people, a hundred ladies at various types of machines assemble a t-shirt.